Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in our modern C++ series. In this lesson, we're going to continue talking about the standard template library and continue our discussion on iterators. So today we're going to be talking about range access, and that is how do we get an iterator from our collections? Now we've seen how some of this is done in previous lessons, so make sure you check those out in regards to a range-based for loop, which will grab us the appropriate beginning and ending iterator. But sometimes we want to iterate through collections in different manners. So how do we do that and what do I mean? Well, I mean sometimes we want to look through a collection from start to beginning or maybe from reverse to end or maybe add a little bit of safety and make sure we don't modify elements. So that's what I mean with range access. So let's go ahead and take a look here. So previously, again, we've looked at this iterator category table here. And this is seemingly um, maybe not as important, but you can go ahead and watch the next video to sort of understand how to read this and what these mean. But again, basically, these are the powers that we get with our iterators. And why does this matter and why am I looking at this? Well, I want to know, for instance, if I can increment through a particular container. That means look from beginning to end. Or can I also decrement it and look to it sort of in a reverse order? And depending on if that's allowed or not, that gives me a hint of can I look at this collection from beginning to end, or can I reverse it and look at this collection backwards to forwards. So on occasion, that can be a very handy or helpful thing to do. Uh, if you want to maybe uh, do a reverse sort of some sort of data structure, maybe you've got an event queue and you want to read through the events backwards for some reason, effectively uh, creating some sort of more stack-like data structure or whatever reason, um, that's going to lead us into what I want to talk about today, which is uh, towards the bottom here, which is our uh, range access operations here. And again, these are the ones that you've probably seen attached to some of the data structures. In fact, we've been using them, but they give us a generic interface for how we access containers here. Okay, so we've got a few of them as well, which are sort of uh, useful here. Things like data, obtaining the pointer to the underlying data, uh, empty size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera here. Okay, so I think these are interesting in a sense of how they're being uh, presented here, and I think there's just a little trick here that I also want to show you. Um, that I think a lot of people don't uh, realize or or maybe don't learn here. Uh, so, anyways, let's go ahead and look at some code here. Now, in the previous video, I was doing some simple examples here where we had a for list, a container uh, accessing an element here. And let's go ahead and run this code here. So compiling with C20 here. And if it successfully compiles, we'll just go ahead and run it here. And we can see I'm grabbing the beginning of this container at one, printing it out, moving to the next element, uh, and then uh, printing it out. And let me actually make sure I save here. We were getting an extra two there. <laughs> so let me. Uh, run the right code there. There we are. Just one and two. That looks better. Um, but, you know, this was the idea here. And again, the advantage of being able to write generic code with a series of um, containers using a uniform interface is that we can swap them. So again, I'm using the STL here. You might be at a company that has their own standard template library or using some other um, data structure, but it is nice if I can just go ahead and switch this to vector, for instance, and then just go ahead and run this and effectively get the same output. But you know, if we've decided that we need the functionalities of vector or that's better for performance, again, be able to switch things out. But what can even make this a little bit more uh, generic and what I like to do is to go ahead and use these uh, range access functions here. There's they're sort of more universal rather than calling the member function here. Uh, now, why do that here? Uh, well, let's just go ahead and you know switch the code around here. Does it make a difference? Uh, no difference at all here, OK? <laughs> um, but what I think that can do here is, again, it's just a little bit more uh, generic code, in my opinion here, um, for, for writing these um, uh, pieces of code here. So I just think it's a little bit more um, easier to work with and it just reads a little bit be better for what you're actually doing. Uh, just, just treating these as functions here. Now, functionally, are they equivalent or more performant? Um, I actually don't have a great answer for that because I've never measured, but they should be the, the same here. I just think it's a better, more generic code and the sort of preferred style here. So if someone does know if it's a difference in performance, you know, please let me know. <laughs> uh, if, if you've done that actual experiment. But what I do like about it, again, stylistically, as far as it's easier to uh, sort of read, is it allows me to make some of the decisions here a little bit more easier if I decide, well, I want to be able to uh, access this iterator here, but I want it to be a uh, 
constant here, okay? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if I try to, uh, let's dereference the actual element here. Let's change it to seven here. Well, I'm restricted here, right? Uh, I am in a read-only mode because I'm using the constant version of this iterator here, okay? So we could go ahead and look at the C begin version here. That's what the C in front of it means here. Now let's go ahead and just play around with this and let's just go ahead and see what the rest are. So if I do R begin, well, let's go ahead and see what that is. Uh, now it's going six and then five here. Uh, so that's kind of interesting here. So, um, and just to make a little bit more sense of it here, let me actually move this element here that I modified here. Just so you can see, we in fact have seven and then five. Let's print out a few more just so you can see clearly what's going on. But this is in fact a reverse iterator here. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and show a few more elements. Seven, five, four, three. And of course I'm modifying that first element here, which is over here. Uh, but if I make this a uh, reverse iterator here and constant, so CR begin. Again, I'm going to get an error here complaining about changing this value here. So let's go ahead and make sure that that's gone here. Just so you can see the rest of the code here, there's nothing else. Here we are. And you can see 6543 here, and then I can't modify the different elements here. Okay, so that's the different range access functions that we have. And of course, we have the other things like size, empty data, for instance, if you're passing around data here. Let's go ahead and um, obtain the pointer uh, to our underlying data here. Um, let's just go say auto, and I'm going to call this data equals data of my container. Uh, let's go ahead and name this something like my data here. Okay, six, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, write out the size of our collection here. So our size, and we'll do size of our container. And let's go ahead and just, uh, let's do a range based for loop here for our elements. Uh, I usually abbreviate E. Now, if they're big elements, we could pass these by reference, uh, but let's go ahead and just do this for my data here. And we'll just call this, uh, well, let's just write out E with some commas here. And let's see what happens here. Uh, and I'll put an end line here. Go ahead and run that. Uh, whoops, looks like a little compiler error here. Let's see what mistakes I have made here. Uh, let's see, doesn't like the end here. Ah, because uh, data is, again, just the underlying pointer here. So let's actually just run through this since I've got the size here. Uh, I'm just going to write this as a uh, regular for style loop here. Size of our container, I++. Plus plus. And it's giving us the underlying pointer here. So let's just go ahead and see if I just print out uh, my data here at the if index. And see what happens if I run this here. Uh, oops, size of, let's see why it doesn't like that here. Ah, expecting a, let's see, oh, extra colon here. Sometimes type these out a little bit too fast. There we go. So there's the size six here that we're printing out. And then I've got the underlying data. Now for a vector, this is relatively easy because um, it is an array. That's the underlying data structure here. Um, and this gets to something that I haven't touched on in the uh, other lessons here, but you know, iterators give us a pointer like interface to our data, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are pointers. Uh, they could be an array and behind the scenes, the iterator is just literally incrementing a value behind the scenes. Okay. Effectively what we're doing here, just accessing the data one at a time doing, you know, I plus plus or plus plus I or whatever, you know, little optimization you want to do. So for example, if I change this to a list, for instance, my underlying data here is not uh, an array here. So we've actually got to figure out, you know, how to iterate through this. This is probably some sort of node type that we'd have to, you know, walk through the chain or whatever here. Um, and let's actually see here um, data itself here. Um, and this is kind of a good hint here. If I change this to a list is probably not available here. Let's go ahead and just see if I do data. Uh, yeah, we we can't get the underlying data because it is just a list itself. It's sort of exposing too many details here. But with a vector, it is useful uh, oftentimes to just get the underlying 
uh, data or a copy of that. I use that all the time in graphics programming when you need uh, to, you know, get some sort of buffer and copy it or pass it along. Um, so anyways, that's just, um, you know, something to know about there. So we do have these little free functions here. I do recommend using them in this style. That's how I, I try to use them or will try to use them going forward. It's just a little bit more clear to show, you know, what the function's doing. Um, and I think it just plays a little bit nicer with um, the generic programming style of things here. And then you, of course, get immediate warnings, um, you know, as you should here. <laughs> Although you'd get these the same with the member functions. Um, if you do change your particular container. So anyways, folks, with that said, I hope that is useful for you. Let's go ahead and just summarize uh, what we've looked at. We've looked at the different reigns access uh, functions here, and you can see we can use them on, well, quite a bit of functions here, not just the containers, but some of the other stuff we haven't looked at, like regex expressions. We've looked at initializer lists a little bit, uh, spans and these types of things. Um, as well, you have access to um, some number, but not necessarily all of these, okay, range access functions. And as always, feel free to sign up uh, and follow along with a series if you'd like to track your progress. And thanks for your time and attention, folks. I hope you're enjoying this discussion on iterators. We're going to move on to other um, topics and uh, continue going forward. So make sure you subscribe to don't miss those. We've got to implement our own iterator. We've got to talk about ranges more. We've got to talk about algorithms. So lots of great stuff coming up. And I'll look forward to uh, seeing you in those next videos.